going on the road with. And we realised that these bands weren't as good as what their records were. Because in Australia, what you did back in those days, you'd style yourself on your favourite bands, which would be the Stones or the Who, great bands. Some of the other bands you think you would have uh, styled something, maybe Sabbath or something like that. You'd listen to the records and then you'd think that's how those bands would sound like. But those records were probably, you know, doctored or whatever they do to records, you know. And then we just realised that these bands were playing live didn't sound anything like the record. So we've been grooming ourselves to sound as good as the records and reproducing the records on stage where these other bands weren't. And it was just a revelation to go over there and see even bands like the Stones uh, who were going through um, probably a pretty nasty period and they would even regard themselves as not being a great period for them live. It just it was a revelation to, to, to take them all that we weren't far away from these guys. And, and it wasn't such a big jump from what we were doing to where we wanted to be. So you, you could tell you could tell it was on the way. Right? Absolutely. You know, ACDC were the end result of everything that had been happening in the 40s and 50s and coming into the 60s uh, in Australia with the pub scene. You know, there's quite a few guys back there that that uh, have been, had a lot of fun in the pub scene. You know, uh, and you know it was a great time, particularly at the 80s. I think it started to end, you know, during the 90s. Um, and so you were there when you know ACDC were starting to work their way through. I, and what was it like touring, constantly touring? And, the, and it was constantly touring at that time because they were really bashing their heads against the wall yeah. um, and really going for it. Yeah. What was it like? Personally, what was it like for you? Personally, well, the fix was that we were spending a lot of time doing support tours uh, to, um, you know, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, uh, Black Sabbath, bands like that, um, Backstreet Crawler. And we were only probably playing 20 to 30 minutes a night. So that's when, to me, that's when the band existed. Those, those, that 30 minutes, that's when it felt like the band. And so you had half an hour a, a day to be what you want to be doing and 23 and a half hours hanging around. So it can be tedious. So you, you occupy yourself with, with, with other things of a social nature. Such as? Um, well, this is before the internet and before <laughs> Skype. Um, so I put down um, women, booze, women, something else. I, I really like women. Yeah, so. That was a, that was a, you're in a rock and roll band, so that's what you do, you know. It, 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 it's, it, I know it may come across as. I be, I, 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 I'm being flippant here, of course. But what I'm trying to point to is that being in a rock and roll band and being on the road, there is, there's, 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 there's a huge slap at the time getting ready to do what you what you do. And so it can be tedious and you know it, 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 what sa what saved me personally was touring London touring England and Europe. Being um, thrown into Europe and thrown into travelling up to Scotland and, and, and being staying in London and going able to get on the tube and go go to the British Museum. What, what saved me for a, a, a lot of my tenure in the ACDC was being in Europe and seeing so many interesting things. Because from when I was a kid, I wanted to travel. So to me, um, that was my saviour. Uh, Bond was probably a, a little bit more uh, into his comics and, and uh, into getting, getting the next ball of Johnny Walker. Now, it all, it all comes to an end and we all, we all know that. We all know the history of the fact that well, obviously you're not with ACDC now, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this right now. Um, I'd be in the Bahamas. You'd be in the, would you be in the Bahamas, do you think? Bahamas trailer park in Gosford, maybe. I doubt a trailer, trailer park. There's somebody else that lives in a trailer park in Gosford, I think. Um, 
when it was coming to an end, yeah. you know, and can we touch on that for a bit? What, when, what did that feel like? Did you sense that something was happening when you realised that it was the chop was coming, or that whatever happened? Tell us. Well, when the end came for me with, with the band, uh, it was wasn't necessarily um, a surprise because I, I, I got a, uh, a couple of shots across my bow previous, not from the. Uh, not from inside the band, but from the road crew. So it wasn't necessarily a, a surprise, but it was certainly a, a huge shock to me. Um, it was it was like getting kicked out of kicked out of the gang because you, you're with these guys. It was like getting kicked out of ACDC. Yeah, well, 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 put it this way: getting kicked out of ACDC then wasn't possibly as painful as getting kicked out of ACDC now. <laughs> so there, there, there is a difference because that's a whole thing with, with the time frame I'm talking about. We, we could, in all intents and purposes, we could be talking about a different man. It, it, it was, it was on its way up. But um, yeah, it, it's, it was, it was, I know it was the, the final meeting I had with uh, the, the guys and Michael Brown. I was just speaking to Michael on the phone just came out here tonight. Um, it, it was difficult for Michael and, and I know it was difficult, particularly difficult, difficult for Phil and Bon. Um, not so different, difficult for Malcolm and Angus. Uh, but, you know, I've got a fairly philosophical view of that whole thing and, 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 and that is, if I was the right guy for the band, I'd still be there. And I, I think my issues uh, within the band um, were viewed as probably my, my, my commitment wasn't there. Uh, and in, in hindsight, that's probably right. I, I was probably too committed to the, the, the social lifestyle uh, of the band, or that, that side of the band anyway. Because you've got to realise that both uh, Malcolm and Angus uh, just had this commitment to, to their cause. It's not a band, it's a cause they have. So it, it, it's, quite, it's quite an easy task to um, to uh, come up short on the commitment stake with those guys because they they don't they don't expect they just think that everyone else would be as committed as what they are not necessarily the case and I, I know that um, uh, Bon felt that too I, I know that he he was um, he, he felt uh, at, at times he, he's uh, that you know, well, you know, it's a cliche, but I know at times he, he felt he was probably skating on thin ice too. Uh, but at that, that point, of, point in time for the band, there was, there was a lot of tension around because we were trying to get to America. Uh, the Dirty Deeds album in America had been knocked back from the, the American record company from refused to, re to uh, release it, mainly because of Bond. They, they, they was, we were getting a lot of pressure from ATCO, uh, the record company over there. They basically wanted us to get another single. Um, and I, I think it's, it says a lot about the, the, uh, the band that, 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 you know, well, I was going to go say we then, but uh, that the band was, was committed to keeping Bond, to, Bond was such an important part of the band, obviously. Uh, it, it's interesting now uh, to note that um, when Dirty Deeds did come out um, after Bond passed away, uh, ATCO released it, and it's it's the highest selling album uh, in the States that Bond was on. Fuck so, I, I, th I think the proof's in the pudding. But at the time, there was a tension around because, you know, it was, it was quite a, a, a lot of chatter we were getting back there saying, you know, I think, you know, basically, you know, I had one, one, one sort of conversation with Michael that was, uh, you know, who wants to get another singer? I've got a question. Hang, hang on, we'll, we'll go to questions in a minute. I think that's um, a lot of people still have trouble with ACDC uh, uh, not having Bon Scott in the band, that new guy that's been there for, how long has he been there, 30 years or something? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's amazing, I, I go to so many gigs and people, you know, oh, you know, I really like the Bond stuff, you know, I don't like the new guy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, get a guy a break, he's been here 30 years. <laughs> Which brings me to a, 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 a point, um, when I saw the band uh, 1981, uh, at the Sydney Showgrounds. Um, it was Brian's first gig here in, in, in Sydney. And um, it was really an odd sensation hearing the guys hit intros that, that I was, like, they were just ingrained. I was like, I was ready to start playing air bass, you know. Um, but, and then hear Brian sing them. It was just, to me, it was a, a, 
a uh, travesty. No, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not right. It was, it, was, it was poignant. It was just really, really odd. And I know it rattled my cage on a couple of times, but because, you know, losing one was, was once again, no great surprise to anyone, but a shock. But watching the guys play with Brian, I was still hurting from losing one, but these guys had lost one, gone on and recorded the most amazing rock and roll album, and made a transition um, almost seamlessly on, on the Brian. And to, if, if I could look at one thing to me that sort of captures ACDC, it's probably that, that transition they, they made from Bond to Brian, and it just, the, the whole thing kept on rolling. Uh, and I think anything less than that would have been a slap in the face to Bond's memory. Uh, but I, I, I had, I've got a lot of respect for those guys for doing what they did, when they did, under the conditions that they did, because it was tough enough for me. But to watch those guys do that and to navigate their way through that, I've got to tell you, I, I take the hand off them. That, that, that was, I think it's, it's one of the greatest, great feats in rock and roll. Uh, back in Black, the second biggest selling album of all time. Yep. And uh, now their back catalogue is the second, or it's the, the, the biggest selling back catalogue of any rock and roll band in the world, is that correct? Has anyone got a handy? <laughs> <laughs> I should not have a part of that. Hey, hang on, we, we, what we've got to do is we, we've, we've got to go to question time, yes. um, and, and then we'll wind up. So uh, I'm going to uh, throw it to you guys, and if you've got some questions, and they have to be questions. Don't say things like, oh, Mark, I remember seeing you guys in 1976 and it was a great night. And actual, uh, some, some great questions would be good at this point. The, the man with the glasses and the beard stuck his hand up. Um, can you just tell us about your recorded albums very quickly in the 70s? Can you tell us uh, well, how, how you managed to make albums so fast, back then? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the the albums I worked on, which were TNT, uh, Dirty D, Sunday Chain, Let the Be Rock, were all done uh, under a very very strict deadline. They were all recorded within a two week period. The first week would be backing tracks, um, and the interesting thing about that, we'd go in the studio. You know, you, most of us here would know about demo recordings. You, you you write the songs, do demos, get the things to sit, and you go in and record them. All the songs, uh, the ACDC albums I worked on, all the songs are actually written in the studio. Uh, the, Angus and Melton, they get together with George, they sit down, knock down uh, a basic structure with the song, and then we'd go in. The first album, uh, a lot of times, George would be in there um, playing bass, because George mentored me a lot with my bass playing. Uh, and then all the songs written in the studio, backing tracks done the first week. We would get the backing tracks together as we'd get the, the, the bones of the songs together. They'd go on a cassette, one would be locked in the kitchen, he'd be writing all the lyrics. So they're all, all done. Um, backing tracks first week, second week would be um, vocals, uh, guitar solos, and then we'd go away and the whole thing would get mixed. Next thing we heard of it, it'd be on the radio, or we'd, we'd have an album cover. Because, you know, because that was a handy thing, because Big Brother George was there, right? Who knew what the guys wanted? And when I say the guys, I mean the band, but every, you know, he had a feel for the band. George was our record producer, but he was like a cheerleader. He was a, he, he mentored me, but he was also mentored the band. George, uh, I don't think it can be overstated how much 